afternoon uh, and welcome to the Outer Temple Chamber's annual cross-border law conference. We're now going to hear from uh, Chris Deacon from Stewart's Law on assessment of personal injury damages under, under foreign law. I don't think I uh, need to give uh, Chris much of an introduction. I expect you probably all know uh, who he is. Um, one of the leading uh, cross-border personal injury lawyers in the country. Chambers um, describe, and partners described him in 2018 as a rising star, an all-round class act puts the extra 10% on top of the 100%. I can't endorse the maths in that, but I, I, I can endorse the rest of it, I think. Um, so um, assessment of personal injury damage under foreign law, obviously um, in practical terms, uh, really crucial because um, for English lawyers um, in particular, the, the, the procedure um, substance divide is often uh, well, interesting, but also can be quite tricky. Um, so I'm looking very much looking forward to, <laughs> to hearing all about it. So over to you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for that kind introduction. And um, I'm delighted to be here today. So thank you to Outer Temple Chambers for inviting me along to speak. Um, you're also all very lucky because this is the third time I think that I've put a tie on in the last seven months. Um, and one of those was for the, uh, the course appearance that I'll be uh, talking about a little later today. So I've been asked to talk about the assessment of uh, personal injury damages under a foreign law and I'm going to talk a bit about the, the history and then get into some of the case law including um, one of my recent cases, Mielowski against Amlin. And um, central to the, the issue of the assessment of personal injury damages under a foreign law when we're before the English courts of course is the, um, the question of expert evidence. So I was particularly interested to hear um, Ian and Karen's thoughts on the, uh, the Griffiths case. And continuing that theme, I'll be looking at some of the issues when the English court is giving permission for uh, expert evidence in cases under which, which are being assessed under a foreign law. Um, so if you can cast your mind back to before the, the Rome II regulation came in, um, we had this distinction in English law, as Dan just alluded to, between substance and procedure and uh, different laws applying to uh, questions of substantive law and procedural law. And that, that divide still remains, although um, there's less of a distinction now we have the Rome II regulation. So we used to have the, um, the lex loci delicti, so the, the law of the place of the accident would apply to the um, uh, the the, the um, uh, assessment of um, uh, the, the question of resolving a dispute arising from a non-contractual obligation and that was reflected in the 1995 Act, the Private International Law Miscellaneous Provisions Act. Um, and under that Act um, we, we did retain that um, clear divide between substance and procedure and that was dealt with in the uh, House of Lords case of Harding and Whelan. Um, where the, the, the House of Lords said that the law of the forum, English law, um, if you're before the English courts, would apply to the quantification of damages um, to be awarded um, because the quantification of damages was a question of remedy or procedure. So you'd look to the law of the place of the accident um, to consider the heads of loss that were recoverable, and that would be fairly straightforward. It would probably be reasonably uncontroversial to get expert evidence telling you what what types of loss you can recover and then the assessment of those losses would then fall um, to English law and English levels of damages. But that all changed when the Rome 2 regulation came in and um, the aim of the Rome 2 regulation was harmonisation. It was to ensure that the courts across the EU were applying the same law to the same disputes and therefore had the intention of trying to reduce the risk of forum shopping. And, and this is set out at recital six of the, the regulation, which um, you'll see I've set out on screen there. The, the regulation aimed at improving the predictability of the outcome of litigation and certainty as to the uh, applicable law. So um, the, the first instalment under the Rome II regulation for uh, us, us um, litigators in uh, cross-border cases in England, but also um, throughout the EU, was from when does Rome II apply? So this was our little amuse-bouche, and that question was answered uh, fairly swiftly in the case of Homer Wu and, and JMF, a, re a reference from the English High Court to the, uh, to the CJEU. 
where uh, the, the court said, well, look, this is all very obvious. Um, you know, what's the problem here uh, for case uh, that Rome 2 entered into force uh, in August 2007, and it applies to events giving rise to damage after the 11th of January 2009. Um, and, and many of you will remember back to when there was a rush to issue claim forms to try and escape the application of Rome 2 at that time, um, a bit like the, uh, the, the, the merry-go-round we've had with Brexit. Um, over the past 18 months or so, where we've been trying to issue um, and, and serve before the Brexit deadline. Um, it, was, it was similar with the, the Rome 2 regulation back then. So our second course, our long entree, if you like, of, uh, of English litigation relating to uh, the Rome 2 regulation and the question of expert evidence was, of course, the case of Wall against Mutuel de Poitiers. And this was a claim arising from uh, an accident um, involving Steve Ward, who was riding on his motorcycle in France back in 2010. And um, he was knocked off his bike, sustained very serious injuries, spinal cord lesion, partial paraplegia. And he brought a claim in the English courts against the liability insurer for um, the, uh, the, the driver that hit him. Liability was admitted, but very quickly there became a dispute over the question of expert evidence and how the English court should deal with the question of expert evidence to enable the assessment of damages under French law to take place. So we know we've got French applicable law under the Rome 2 regulation, but how do you deal with expert evidence? And you'll recall that in this case, um, the defendant was saying, well, under French procedure, that's what applies here to assess this claim under French law. Um, we have uh, one expert, he may consult a number of sub-experts, but he will then just produce one report. So you have one expert reporting to the court, um, and he may be drawing on areas of expertise that he has uh, no expertise in to provide that evidence to the court. Um, whereas the claimant was saying, uh, no, um, this is a, a question of procedure, falls under part 35 of the CPR, and I should be entitled to have permission to obtain and rely upon the full suite of expert evidence that you would see in a claim for catastrophic injury. Uh, and as you'll know, that, that can uh, range between 10 and 15 uh, expert disciplines reporting to the court. So uh, the first on the uh, on the, the, the this long entree, this taster menu that was Wall and Mutuel de Poitiers um, was Master Cook ordering a preliminary issue back in 2012 um, uh, when, when the country was uh, still a, 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 a happy place before Brexit, before coronavirus back in 2012 was still riding high off the back of the London Olympics and Master Cook in this long running uh, litigation is ordering a preliminary issue as to whether um, the question of which expert evidence the court should order falls within evidence and procedure, so is therefore governed by English law as the law of the forum uh, and falls within Article 1.3 of Rome 2, or alternatively, does it fall within the scope of the applicable law under Article 15 uh, and is determined with reference to French law? And Mr. Justice Tugendhat in January 2013 uh, gave the, the first High Court decision on this issue, uh, and he said that um, the question of which expert evidence the court should order uh, is determined by reference to the law of the forum, uh, because it's a, a question of evidence and procedure. The defendants weren't having that, and they uh, first made a, a, an application on the papers for permission to appeal. And I think the words of Sir Richard Buxton here are quite striking when he declined the, the defendant's uh, request for permission to appeal. He said that an English judge would need to be persuaded that a revolution had taken place before he countenanced the determination of procedures for reduction of evidence by reference to any system of law other than the Lex Fori. But that didn't put the defendants off, as we know, so they uh, were successful in their oral application for permission to appeal, and the Court of Appeals decision was handed down in February 2014. And uh, here's what the Court of Appeal said, some of the key extracts that are relevant to this question of uh, expert evidence in the context of uh, a claim for, for personal injury damages. Um, rejecting the defendant's argument that we should have evidence pursuant to the French procedures. Lord Justice Longmore said an English court is ill-equipped to receive expert evidence in that way. And um, 
the court, the court of appeal was unable to accept the defendant's position that the English court should strive to reach the same outcome as a French court, um, let alone uh, the end point of the defendant's argument that the, the, the evidence should be given in the English court in a, a French style expert report. Um, the, the court went on to say that um, the claimant's position, their interpretation accord with the natural meaning of Article 1.3, um, the defendant's construction of the Rome II regulation was artificial. And, um, you know, this is quite striking. It, the, the, the court said it's unrealistic and inefficient to expect courts to adopt the evidential practices of a different jurisdiction when, uh, when determining questions of fact. Um, courts overseas uh, aren't um, set up to receive evidence in the way that re we receive evidence um, in the courts of England and Wales, and uh, the, the reverse works the same. Lord Justice Christopher Clark added that any question as to the extent to which and the form and manner in which expert evidence may be given and how many experts may give evidence, all of these questions which come up time and again at case management are almost self-evidently questions of evidence and procedure. And so in summary, as a result of Wall, um, the position is that expert evidence is a matter of evidence and procedure. So it's determined in, in accordance with the law of the forum. But of course, when you've got a foreign applicable law case, you do need to uh, make fairly extensive inquiries with your foreign law expert to make sure that um, the, uh, the, you're looking further than just the black letter law, but also the non-binding um, provisions. And this extends to guidelines, conventions, uh, any scales or tariffs. And um, we all know from, from dealing with these foreign law cases that um, th those provisions can be quite wide ranging. We're not just looking at, for example, uh, the French or the Spanish civil code, but uh, a, a much wider range of tools that, that are available when um, assessing uh, damages for personal injury under the foreign law. So in June, June 2014, I finally got my trip to Paris um, to see Monsieur Charpentier. Um, I was assisting Scott Rigby uh, at the time um, in this case, and we shifted to uh, focusing on the assessment of damages with the full range of uh, experts that we've been given permission for. And we obviously had to have input on uh, the assessment of damages under French law, which we had from uh, Jérôme Charpentier, uh, and the case uh, eventually settled. Wall hasn't provided all the answers, and, and we know that from, from day to day practice. Um, although the guidance, um, it seems to me, is, is very clear, uh, and it was uh, an extensive and very considered decision of the Court of Appeal, uh, as you would expect in, in Wall and Mutual, um, day to day we still see uh, case management and beyond um, defendants arguing for uh, approaches which might take us back to the source of arguments that were being run in Wall and Mutual and were uh, unequivocally dismissed by the, the course of appeal. And I've just set out here and I'd be interested to hear from, from participants as, as well as to their experience, but the, the types of issues that um, typically arise in, in case at the case management stage. So um, I, I, I've seen this before uh, on, on a number of occasions that what, what do you do about reports that have been obtained pre-proceedings um, uh, from foreign medico legal experts? These are usually obtained by defendants in, in my experience, and they then try and get this evidence in uh, by the back door at case management stage. I have seen high court masters um, recording in, in the directions order the fact that that evidence has been obtained. So it is kind of there in the background and part of the evidential matrix in the case. Time and again, the question of uh, the timing of expert evidence arises, and um, this, this came up in uh, Mielowski and Amlin as well. Um, uh, should the foreign law expert evidence come before or after the medical expert evidence? And I, I've spoken about this um, on a number of occasions to uh, the, the, the many of the leading claimant practitioners in, in this area, and I know that um, people have differing views. My, my take on this is that you have to have at least some foreign law uh, expert evidence before you go and finalize and serve your medical expert evidence in these cases, um, because there could be issues under the foreign law that influence the nuance of how a medical expert expresses themselves, uh, even if 
because you you, you need um, the the medical expert evidence, for example, to make a proper determination of which um, provisions or case law is relevant for the assessment of general damages. You then have an updating report at a later stage. I appreciate that I'm probably talking here more about the flexibility of a, a, a multi-track uh, case timetable. Issues over the content of the expert's evidence, what should the foreign law expert be reporting on? Um, whether English, uh, and I say English in inverted commas, I mean medical legal experts who are giving uh, evidence to the court in the, the, the usual way under English um, procedural rules, should comment on issues uh, under the foreign applicable law. I've seen cases where the medical experts have been specifically ordered by the, the master to address certain issues um, arising under the foreign law to try and help the trial judge when he's he or she is assessing damages. And this blurring of lines between the foreign law expert evidence and foreign medico legal expert evidence, I think we see. And this is where the defendant in uh, Mielowski um, came a cropper in what I'm going to call a, a case of defendant indigestion, um, keeping up the, uh, the, the, the food theme to my subheadings. So in uh, Mielowski and, and Amlin, well, in summary, uh, this, this was a, an interim application decision of Master Davison in April this year. And the case reiterates the principle that the party should only be given permission to rely on expert evidence as to foreign law, where the case is before the English courts and uh, English procedural rules apply. And that evidence as to foreign law will be alongside permission to have the usual suite of medico legal evidence um, in a claim for personal injury damages. And it's not appropriate for the parties to have permission to rely on a report from a foreign medico legal examiner or, or forensic expert, even though that may form part of the procedures that apply under the um, law of the, uh, the, the, the courts of the country whose law applies under Rome two. The background facts, just very briefly in Mielowski and Amlin, um, this was a family who were, had been in Latvia for their summer holidays in 2017. They're traveling back through Belgium when they're involved in a serious road traffic collision. And uh, all but one of the family are injured. Um, one of the children of the family seriously injured a, a severe traumatic brain injury. Uh, liabilities admitted and proceedings were issued in the High Court in 2018. Uh, we get to the first case management conference in June 2019, where Master Davison, amongst other things, gave the parties permission to rely on expert evidence in the field of Belgian law. And I've added the emphasis there in the field of Belgian law. We served a report from Mr. Bernard De Witt, um, a Belgian lawyer specialising in insurance and assessment of personal injury damages. Um, and uh, the defendant serves a report from its chosen expert. Now this case hasn't been reported and I'm gonna preserve the, the identity of, uh, of the defendant's expert um, uh, so as not to, to sling any mud because it may not have been actually his fault that um, his uh, report came under such scrutiny. But as I'm sat reading this report just before Christmas last year, it immediately becomes apparent to me um, that it's not evidence which the defendant has been given permission to rely on. Um, firstly, it's a valuation report, um, which is obviously um, get, getting into the territory of the role of the judge. The report, quite astonishing, astonishingly in my view, tried to introduce by the back door evidence from a Belgian forensic medico-legal expert. So it effectively appended a report from Dr. Verhoeven. Um, I'm, no doubt that, it, that he is a great and well-respected expert in relation to the assessment of damages in uh, Belgium, but of course it's not appropriate for uh, him to be giving evidence um, on these matters in, in the English courts, given the, the guidance from the Court of Appeal in Wall, and also more fundamentally, um, the, the defendant didn't have permission for his evidence. There was actually very little in the way of Belgian law because, of course, faced with a report like this, you, you first think, well, can we, can, you know, let's not be too heavy handed. Can this report be redacted in any way? Um, but actually, I've, I, I mean, I, I forget how many pages the report ran to, um, but there was about a page and a bit that was actual law. Um, so 
I, I didn't really think it was capable of uh, redaction. So we applied, uh, the claimants applied um, to exclude the evidence of the Belgians, a uh, defendant's Belgian law expert, which incorporated Dr. Verhoeven. And the defendant, uh, rather than when, when they saw our application and the evidence in support, rather than uh, reflecting on that, um, considering the position in Wall and the, the, the guidance there, and what to me were very obvious problems with the report, they issued a cross application for permission to rely on the evidence of a Belgian medico legal expert, arguing that that was required for the proper determination of the claims. So the matter came before Master Davison and he granted the claimant's application, the, the defendant's cross application was um, dismissed. I just want to look at some of the arguments, um, four key areas really that, 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 that uh, form part of the arguments in the case. The first, as I've already mentioned, was the scope of permission for expert evidence on foreign law. And fundamentally, the report served by the defendants was outside the scope of the permission that had been given by Master Davison in, in his case management directions. Secondly, the adoption of uh, Belgian procedure and rules of evidence in the defendant's reports. Um, there are a number of issues here. Um, the, the defendant's expert had relied on the report from Dr. Verhoeven and Dr. Verhoeven, he hadn't seen all of the evidence because it hadn't been served. So he, he was making an assessment of damages without having sight of all of the evidence that was relevant to that question. And he also hadn't examined the claimants in person. Um, there was an attempt uh, to quantify the claim for care and assistance without having sight of any care evidence in the form of either witness evidence or expert opinion. Um, the, the, the report made treatment recommendations, even though it was a report from a lawyer. Um, I, I like to fancy myself as a bit of a, uh, a, a home style GP, um, mm. uh, but uh, a bit of an amateur GP uh, when it comes to certain things, but even I wouldn't go that far in uh, providing an expert report. And um, the, the report set out the, the expert's opinion on his valuation without give, giving any reasoning or, or explanation, which perhaps harps back to uh, some of the, uh, the points that Ian and Karen were, were mentioning uh, in relation to the expert evidence in uh, Griffiths. Um, there was one particular line in the report which I liked, which was where the expert said, the additional cost of a new vehicle naturally cannot be claimed. If such were the case, Mr. Mihalovsky may well have bought a wildly expensive one, open brackets, a Tesla, for example, close brackets. Thirdly, the, the, the defendant was saying the assessment of damages under Belgian law involves a complicated Barem system. And uh, well, that, that in itself is unobjectionable, of course it does. Um, but the defendant was arguing that that requires a desktop report from a Belgian medical legal expert because um, the English experts have no experience of the Barem. Um, the claimants argued in response that, that the issue with that is that you might end up with this super expert. Um, uh, get, get, the, the Belgian medico legal expert would have this kind of super status sitting above all the other experts and, and perhaps trumping those experts. Um, and that would be this sort of hybrid approach um, where you'd have so much expert evidence at play uh, the trial judge may not know whether he or she was coming or going. Uh, and fourthly, um, this was a case of a, a straightforward application of the, the guidance from the Court of Appeal in uh, Wall and Mutuel. Um, when applying the foreign law, um, we, we said the English court is not required to secure the same outcome as the courts of the country where the accident occurred. So it doesn't have to rigidly follow the approach to expert evidence in those countries. The defendant tried to distinguish Wall on the basis that this was all about case management decisions. So it fell within um, part 35 and the, 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 the uh, master's uh, discretion as to what evidence should be allowed. Master Davison determined, um, as I said in opening, he, he determined that the report ser served by the defendant didn't fall within the scope of the permission he'd given at the, the first CMC in the case, and um, that uh, that only allowed an expert in Belgian law on the issue of quantum. Um, he commented that 
Um, the defendant's evidence stands in sharp contrast to the claimant's Belgian law expert evidence. It, it was more like a schedule or a counter schedule in the way that it tried to, to value uh, the claim. And um, so it, it, was, it was usurping the role of the judge and um, it, it gave a, an opinion as to the proper valuation of the claim, which is not the role of expert evidence in these cases. He reiterated the guidance laid down by the Court of Appeal in Wall as to the approach that should be taken uh, when granting permission for expert evidence in a claim uh, to which a foreign law applies. And he, he agreed with the claimants that uh, this was a case which was on all fours with um, the, the, the approach adopted by the Court of Appeal in Wall. And this was to address the attempt by the defendants to distinguish this case from uh, the decision in Wall. Um, he said there was a close parallel between the defendant's approach and the course the defendant in Wall wanted to adopt and which was, of course, rejected. Um, he said that in this case, there would be an additional objection uh, to introduce a Belgian doctor sitting uh, above the English medical, me medical experts uh, would be to adopt a hybrid procedure which would not truly lie in one camp or another. This would be a mess and the trial judge would not thank me. So here are uh, the, the petty fours to, to round things off. Um, the, the, the practice points arising from Master Davison's um, decision. And, and in setting out these practice points, he actually lifted um, effectively from uh, a paragraph in the, the claimant skeleton argument um, uh, in, in giving guidance as to how in broad terms, these cases which involve um, assessment under a foreign law should be approached. So firstly, you have the, the foreign law expert dealing with foreign law. They will identify the soft or non-binding provisions or guidance used in the assessment of damages. Ideally, they would be appending those provisions to their reports. Um, that's, that, that, that can be a difficult area for claimants, I accept, because you can end up with some very extensive guidance, which is in a foreign language, and you then have to um, form a view as to what, if anything, you're going to uh, have translated, but of course the, the experts um, who, who we go to in these cases, particularly in the well-known jurisdictions, are very familiar with the requirements, and so um, they, they will um, be accustomed to setting out the key provisions in their report translated into, into English very often. Uh, secondly, thereafter, once you've got that foreign law expert evidence, the medical experts um, should prepare reports that deal with the causation of injury, condition and prognosis in the way that we're accustomed to under English rules of procedure. Thereafter, the lawyers for the claimants and defendants use all of that evidence to present the case in the form of the uh, schedule and then the counter schedule. Um, and Master Davison noted that that was the approach that had been adopted by the claimants in, in this case um, when pleading the, the uh, claim for damages in the preliminary schedules of lots and when setting out um, the, the claim in the schedules you'll be drawing on all of that uh, guidance the black letter law but also the non-binding guidance under under the uh, the foreign law regime for assessing damages and fourthly if the parties can't reach agreement off the back of those um, schedules and counter schedules um, then uh, the case goes to trial and it's for the trial judge to determine the assessment of damages based on the evidence before him. Um, the trial judge doesn't need to have recourse to a, um, a foreign medical legal examiner to perform that task under English rules of procedure. So some concluding thoughts, um, and I'd be interested to hear from uh, anyone else as to their experiences and uh, how they've dealt with these issues. I think one of the things with the case in, in Mielowski is that um, there may be deficiencies in uh, the evidence that serves by both claimants and defendants in these cases, because it's not always easy to, to reconcile how uh, and to split out these, these issues of uh, foreign law and, and the valuation and assessment of damages. But I think that this was such an obvious example of um, it being inadmissible evidence that um, it resulted in, in this application and, and this decision from uh, Master Davison. Um, it's a question that comes up time and again um, at, at case management stage and um, 
so everyone's going to have a different approach to uh, how they how they deal with these issues. But what's very clear from the decision is that there's no place for foreign medico legal or for or forensic uh, expert assessment reports in cases um, to which uh, a foreign law applies when assessing personal injury damages before the English courts. Um, so that was all uh, I had to say today. Thank you. And uh, I'd be pleased to take any questions that anyone has. I must say, it's a very interesting decision, uh, Chris. Is that is that reported anywhere or on Bailey or, or, or Lawtel? Not yet. No, it's it, it wasn't reported. I've, I've done a very detailed article um, uh, setting out the, uh, the the decision, but uh, and we, we actually thought the defendant might appeal that decision, but they they didn't um, just because of it, be, you know, being an opportunity for the courts to revisit that guidance in Wall and see whether there were any cases where it might be distinguished, um, you know, particularly um, where you have um, a barem style or tariff style system for for assessing damages. Yeah. Um, I mean, that issue about um, whether a, a medico legal expert um, is, is necessary or not in a case where a foreign law applies comes up so often um, as a sort of uh, battle at, at case management hearings. Um, <clears throat> um, and it's very interesting what, what you were saying about it. Um, I mean, the, in my experience, um, it's very difficult to get permission for a claimant to get permission for, for an expert like that. Judges are very sceptical about it. And if you want to get permission for something like that, um, you really need something from the um, legal expert saying, I need this. I won't be able to quantify the case or provide a report without it. Um, and unless you have that, it's, it's an uphill. <laughs> I don't know if that that's your sort. You, I mean, you, you would say after the uh, this case, it's in principle just difficult to see how it would be. Even then, would be uh, permission to be given for that. Yeah, I mean, I think this case is is a, a an application on in a particular set of circumstances and facts of the of the guidance in Wall. Because if you look back to Wall and Mutual, you know, it's kind of all in there, and and that was. That, that was the, uh, the, the, the dicta that we relied upon when, when arguing this before Master Davison. Um, I, th I think it, you know, it is difficult in practice, and I think that we, we do see reports coming through where, I mean, I, I see it from, from experts, where they start to try and value the case or they can be quite resistant. Our Belgian law expert, um, you know, in, in, in this case, um, would set out in his report how um, in a short paragraph, how the assessment would work under Belgian law, but of course, um, Belgian procedural rules, but of course, um, that's not how this, this plays out in the English courts because of our rules of procedure. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's why I make the point about the timing of the evidence, because you, you need to know what, the, um, what, what issues um, the medical experts might be required to deal with under the foreign law before you finalize that evidence, because you, you may then have to get the medical experts to frame their evidence in a particular way or to address certain certain questions in, in their evidence um, so that you, you've kind of covered all bases. Yes, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, I, I think I was arguing only the other week in a, at a hearing that, um, that the legal evidence should be, report should be provided first, and then we all know what, what, what scheme we're working to, but uh, I didn't succeed in that argument. Uh, but uh, but uh, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. And, and likewise, if there's an, an issue about what is the applicable law, then that should be resolved first by way of a preliminary issue before you get the before you get the uh, you know the, the medical expert evidence served. Mm -hmm. I would have thought. But it's but the the approach that, that you you've explained isn't isn't necessarily what's followed at the moment. No, and you know that I, I know that in practice, you know, different different approaches, and um, I, I think that my sense is from from talking to others that more often than not, the uh, the, the master, the district judges will uh, will order the foreign law expert evidence to follow the the, the medical evidence, um, but yeah. and you know. The, the reality is that you know these these things will work themselves out, but I, I just have some concerns about 
the that that being the order of things. It, m most recently, I've seen uh, on, on one of my cases uh, the, the the master ordered um, a heads of loss report, then the medical evidence, and then we have an updating report. Um, yes. And I think that that's that's a German law case, and I think that that's a helpful approach in that case because when we go back to the German law expert with the medical evidence, um, they will then be able to give us a clearer steer on uh, the, the general damages and the range of awards and comparator case law from the German courts that um, will, will inform uh, the, the, the assessment of yes. damage, pain and suffering. I, I think one, one thing you really hit on in, in your talk is, is I think there's a bit of a, a misconception amongst some judges about what it is that the foreign law experts actually trying to do for us and what they're properly trying to do is to tell us really what the rules are what the what the scheme is um not to not to provide evaluation so i think one of the reasons why um lots of judges say oh we'll have all the evidence first and then we'll have uh, reports from the foreign lawyers is that they're sort of conceiving as the foreign law evidence as a sort of valuation step at the end but well, actually that's not that's not what it is um the kind of arguments you were having in your case, um, I had and seen in many in many cases, um, and, and judges are surprisingly willing to allow you know, what is effectively valuation evidence in. You know, um, they don't observe the distinction. Another question has come in: uh, Do you think that not using foreign medico legal input means that cases are much more likely to go to trial to resolve the differences? No. I mean, I've just I've just settled a case two weeks before trial um, where um, you you know we we th we thought we were going very close to the wire. This was uh, actually a, a Cypriot law case. Um, we there was no foreign medico legal e expert evidence. Now you might say, well, that's normal in that type of case because actually their, their their system is heavily influenced by us. Um, but I, I don't really think it does make a difference um, because in that case, we, w we went very close to the wire um, and it, it wasn't because of the lack of foreign medical legal evidence. There were other issues. Um, and I think people just kind of re resolve the cases and settle them and find a way through. Um, they, they may, to, to try and help inform settlement, have their foreign law expert um, provide a view on, on valuation. Um, but that, you know, I think that there's a distinction between doing that for, for settlement purposes and, you know, the evidence that should form yes. before the court um, to, to try the issues. Yes. Um, and one last thing, because uh, we have uh, two other speakers who will probably be ready any moment. Um, how often, because you only really do the really big cases now, don't you? Um, catastrophic claims and so on. Um, how often, in your experience, is the default rule the English law applies. Does that happen in in a case where foreign law applies quite often, or or not? I mean, or, or do, do both sides invariably adduce evidence of foreign law in a case where where that law is the applicable law? Yeah, I've I, I've I've never seen it. Um, yeah, I think Scott had a case. Scott Rigby had a case um, recently. I think Sarah Crowther is his lead counsel on that case where the parties agreed to English law, they resolve liability issue in a case that would have been subject to German law and then agreed that the assessment of damages would be under English law. Um, but I, I think that's rare. I, in, in yeah, my experience, I suppose when the differences are quite big on quantum, which they are, I, I mean, I expect that the answer is probably different on liability issues when they're, you know, you can agree English law because it won't make any difference. But look quantum with care and earnings claims. It's a different kettle of fish, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, well, thank you. It, it may be it, it may be driven by, you know, who who's the insurer? Because if you've got an English an English insurer who's used to reserving and paying damages in accordance with English law principles, at, but they happen to be indemnifying in relation to a case where a foreign law applies, they might, from a commercial point of view, say, we don't want to get bogged down in all of that foreign law experts evidence. We'll just deal with the case in accordance with English law. Yeah, I think I think it's much more common in, in 
not necessarily in the catastrophic cases, but the you know the serious but not catastrophic. Um, well, that that's super. Thanks, Chris, very much.